morning. Good morning. Welcome to Light of the Valley. It is the second Sunday in Advent, and we continue to have that, that message, that theme that Advent reflects of the coming and looking ahead, not just as we prepare for, for Christmas, but looking ahead also to when our King will return again. Pretty much everything you need is inside your uh, worship folder, as per the usual, and we'll begin by singing uh, hymn number one today, the Advent of our King. Hymn number one. God bless you, worship. Correct whatever wrongs I can, and serve you with 
serve you and those around me with love and good works. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. We'll praise him by singing verses 1 and 3 of hymn 23, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. This is the word of our Lord. Second lesson comes from Romans chapter 15, verses 4 to 13. Paul writes, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the Lord, the God of our Lord, the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Accept one another, then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. And moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. Again it says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, 
Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him the Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the word of our Lord. Please stand to sing the Alleluia. The Gospel for the second Sunday in Advent comes from Matthew chapter 3, reading verses 1 to 12. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I invite the children to come forward for a children's message. <coughs>
Yeah, God does make that happen. And see, this is where we're talking about. It's a good point, Colette. That was a miracle. And that's the miracle of what we're hearing about today in the Bible and what I'm going to talk about with everybody during the sermon is that God takes something dead, this stump. There's no way that tree was going to grow. And yet he brought life. Just like seeing that new plant, that new growth, right there. And that's what he's saying is going to happen with Jesus. It looked like Jesus was dead. And in fact, we know Jesus' story. We know he did die on the cross. Exactly. And then God brought him back to life to know just what Lily said, which is that he takes all our sins away and that we will go to heaven because Jesus came back from death to life, just like the stump in the new life. So let's pray about that. Let's thank God. Let's fold our hands by our heads and pray. Dear God, thank you for bringing life where there was death. Even with Jesus' death, when he died on the cross, you brought him back to life to show us that all the wrong things we've ever done, all our sins, they are taken care of, and you will take us to heaven because of Jesus. Thank you for giving him our King. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys can head back to Chris. Thank you for coming up here this morning. We're going to continue by singing hymn number three. Lift up your heads, you mighty gates. Hymn number three.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A portion of God's Word that we're going to focus on this morning was the uh, first lesson we heard from Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 10. If that's a good meditation on that word, let us pray. Lord, as we come and rejoice in the fact that you have already come once, lift our eyes that we would look longingly for your coming again, that we would wait for you, put our hope and our trust only in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Your friends in Christ, transport yourself, if you can, to being an Israelite about the 8th century B.C. You've grown up kind of in the shadow and the legacy of the great King David, of that massive kingdom that, that he put together through conquest, through sword, through defeat of his enemies. You've spent your time going to his son's temple, Solomon's temple, in all its glory and its majesty as you come and offer those sacrifices as you're there for every major religious festival. You know that you've had that promise ringing in your ears that a king will come from David's line. And he is going to make everything better. Right now, though, the king we have, King Ahaz, he's, he's not so good. He's definitely deviated away from where David had been, from where Solomon had been. King Ahaz is advocating these, these foreign gods, these other gods. In fact, he's done things that are despicable, things that are, that are kind of squeamish, things that just kind of make you want to throw up. He, he offered one of his own sons to one of these false gods, sacrificed him. But still, I have that hope, that promise, that as long as a descendant of David sits on that throne, we have someone to rally behind. We have a ruler and a king that we can get behind because we know that there is one greater than all of these that is still coming. But sadly, with Ahaz, it's we're starting to notice the wear on the nation. Borders are starting to shrink. It's not as grand as it used to be. In fact, there are two major threats growing. There's one off to the northeast of us, these Assyrian people. Their, their violence is becoming things of horror stories. And then we have these people, these Egyptians, to the southwest. People that once enslaved us. People that 600 years ago were taking our baby boys and, and throwing them in the Nile, killing them. We know a battle is coming, a war is coming, and we are right in the middle of this thing. And you can bet when those armies come marching through, they will not march through peacefully. What do we do? Who do we rally behind? Who, who can save us from these things that are coming? Do we really want to put our support behind one or the other? Neither option really seems good at all. I mean, if we talk about the Egyptians, these are our former oppressors, our former captors, the one who made us into slaves and oppressed us very violently, very brutally. Do we just say that's water under the bridge and, and take up arms with them and, and hope that they don't try to enslave us once more? But these Assyrians, they're bloodthirsty. <laughs> Any pact we make with them, any, any treaty, are they ever going to keep it? Or once we're done being useful to them, will they come through and pillage and take whatever they want and kill our people? We can't fight a war on two fronts. We're not strong enough. We don't have enough people to hold our own. So what's the lesser of two evils? That phrase, the lesser of two evils, you probably said it, probably uttered it, probably in the last month as you were sitting there getting ready to mark off on your ballot box who you wanted. Who's the lesser of the evils? Because we look for these people to get behind. And we want them to think like us. We want them to act like us. We want them to just be totally 100% good. We want them to always do the right thing. We want them to do everything that we think they should do. And yet, when we actually start looking at the leaders that we have, so few of them actually fit those kind of qualifications. 
And then we're stuck in this mode of like, okay, well, who's not as bad as the other? And there's a part of us that as we think about having to rally behind leaders, as we think about people who are going to do jobs that we ourselves are not qualified to do, that we ourselves don't want to do, and we, have, we elect these people, we get behind them to do these things, it doesn't feel right that I should have to make a choice that I don't like to make, that I don't really want any of these options. It doesn't feel right, it doesn't feel good to, to pick someone who is the lesser of two evils. So it was with the Israelites. As they were looking, which army do we rally behind, the Assyrians or the Egyptians? But either one, I don't like it. And then God comes along through the prophet Isaiah and just kind of destroys all their choices. He tells them, Egypt will be no help to you. He tells them that, in fact, Assyria will come and cut you down. This dynasty of David, this family tree of David, it will be reduced to a stump. And as an Israelite, you start thinking, well, but that's where we pinned all of our hopes. That was the cause we were rallying behind. If we lose that king, if we lose that dynasty, that family tree, what hope can we have? Who is there left? Who can save us? Who do you rally behind? When you think about the leaders that we have, whether it be current president, president-elect, when you think about congressmen, you think about representatives, you think about Supreme Court justices, you think about mayors, you think about all these people, who do you rally behind you? Do you put your faith and your trust in your leaders? I mean, to a degree, we're forced to. We have to if we're going to remain citizens of this country. We have to trust them to lead us. Do we put our faith behind the laws and the legislation that, that the Constitution, that that document will stand, that document will guarantee me my freedoms, it will, it will hold me, it will preserve me? That will save me. Whether it's coming to rally behind these kind of leaders, rallying behind legislation, I can tell you this, the same thing that the Israelites found out, we will find out too. Any of these can be cut down at any moment and be destroyed. If we rally behind anything that is not God, it always stands that eventually, one day, these things will be cut down we will not be saved. What hope can we have if we can't put that behind earthly rulers? Well, to a people who after hearing this seemingly had no hope, God gives them hope. Through Isaiah, God comes to his people and tells them, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Something that was killed, something that was cut down, something that should have no life into it whatsoever. From that very dead thing, God will bring life. You're worried about this, this line of David, this family tree of David that's cut down. Well, I'll tell you what, even though it will be cut down, it will be done because you are wicked, because you put your trust and you rally in things other than me. It will be cut down. But I will bring life out of death. A shoot will rise up. New life will come up from this dead stump. And he's going to be a king unlike any other king that you've seen before. Isaiah goes on with that description. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. That this king is not just going to be a wise king, an understanding king, a king who is not just intellectually sound, but he is also 
physically capable of carrying out his responsibilities and his duties, unlike any other person before. In fact, his life's work, his goal is going to be everything in this, that he will delight in the fear of the Lord. That everything this king does is going to do it because he loves the will of God. He loves obeying God. He puts all of those morals, all those principles, everything riding on what God has commanded to him. That is what he does. And in doing so, he will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decides by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He doesn't have self-interest. He doesn't have hidden agendas. He doesn't have selfishness in all of this. And in fact, in all of his judging, and all of his, his, his responsibilities, and all of his duties, he's never going to do it in such a way that he just sees what can be perceived, but in fact will look behind it, will judge with righteousness and with justice. That just in the off chance that what he sees might not actually be true, that what he heard might just be hearsay, he will make sure that it is judged by truth, by righteousness. And then finally, he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. He will defeat the evil of this world. He will deliver us from our enemies. You wouldn't have to sit there and wonder, who do I need to ally myself so that I can possibly stand to defend my homeland, my nation, my country? No, this kid will slay the wicked. He will usher in an unprecedented period of peace. So much of that description that comes next, it even would affect this world, nature around us, that not just we would live at peace with each other, just not that we wouldn't have to take arms up against other people, against foreign powers, but that in fact the entire animal kingdom would be at peace. To think for a moment that if, if you had a viper's nest just sitting out in your front yard, you could say to your little kid, yeah, that's okay, go ahead and play with them. Put your hand down in that nest. Don't worry. They won't bite. They won't harm you. No, in fact, God says that everything on that day, when that king comes, they will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. Well, now that's a king to rally them. If that king is truly going to give us peace, unlike anything we've ever seen before, to make everything in this world, not just our relationships with each other, but in fact our relationships with the whole entire side of nature and the animal kingdom at peace, when will this happen? When will this king come? Well, he'll come, as he says, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, he's talking about the last day. On that day, when he comes, he will have his entire nations gathered to him to no longer bear the distinctions of geography or of ethnicity, but that they will all come up to his holy mountain just like we learned, just like we talked about last week. And in that day, in that moment, when Christ returns, there will be a peace unlike any other. And it's because of this, because Isaiah was looking ahead to that moment, he had already given people the signs which to look for. He had told them just a couple chapters earlier, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. We know this king. We look forward to celebrating once again the fact that he has already come once. That the Emmanuel, the true man, the true God, the God with us, he has come. He grew up like a shoot out of that dead stump. That he did grow old. He did bear the fruits of righteousness. That he did 
delight in doing the will of God, that he did everything that God asked him to do, everything God wanted him to do, and he enjoyed every moment of it. He did it for us so that then he made the last act, his final act, the final fruit be his death, where he paid for all of our sins to bring us peace. To say that the war between you and God is done, I've won the victory. You stand at peace with him. It's proved by the fact that after three days he rose from the dead. And then he ascended into heaven 40 days after that, specifically telling us, you will see me again. I will come again. See, when Isaiah looked ahead, he looked, blurred, he, looked, he looked first for the birth of the Emmanuel, of God with us. And he knew after that, too, yet the day of the Lord would still yet come that last day, that judgment day. There would come that day when he would arrive, this, this shoot from the stump of Jesse, and he would reign in that peace. On that day, that last day, God ends all wickedness, all sin. He removes it entirely and brings a new heaven and a new earth. Isaiah was telling the Israelites this message so that they would wait. Wait and rally behind the person who can bring you long-lasting, eternal peace. Don't settle for the lesser of two evils. Don't settle for the Assyrians. Don't settle for the Egyptians. They will not save you. They cannot save you. Wait for the king, the one coming up, the shoot from the stump of Jesse. Wait for him. Wait and rally behind that king because there is no king like him, no king who can bring what he brings. And we know, now that we can look out in hindsight, that was a long wait. That was nearly 800 years from the time Isaiah prophesied this to when Jesus came, born of a virgin named Mary. But he told him to wait. Because this king is worth the wait. This king is worth rallying behind and getting behind. Because he's not the lesser of two evils. He is 100% good. He is the best possible ruler that we can have, that no one else could ever eclipse him. No one could ever be greater than him. So don't put your trust in the things of this world. Don't put your trust in earthly rulers or in earthly laws. Put your trust in this coming king, one who will come from something that looks dead. But he will come to usher in this era of peace. But on that last day, when he returns, we will have this picture that Isaiah portrays of unprecedented peace. So what Isaiah told the Israelites, we're hearing again today, wait. Look for his coming. Don't settle for less. Don't settle for the lesser of two evils. Don't put your trust in anything else, but put it in the root of Jesse, the shoot that will come up from that stuff. Wait for our coming King, Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please stand. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit as you wait for the coming King. Amen. We sing the created me.
and visitors who are with us today. Um, while the ushers are passing out the offering plates, uh, we ask if you'd like to leave us some contact information. There's little cards in each of the pews with the information you can fill out. What we do with that is uh, you can put that in the plate or give it to me after the service, and I'll follow up with you uh, sometime this week um, and just see if there's more you'd like to learn about our church. So that in mind, let's continue our worship by gathering our gifts and offerings to the Lord. centuries, you repeated and affirmed your promise to send the offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's head. Through your prophets of old, you continually directed the eyes of your people to the advent of their Savior. We praise you, O Lord, for keeping your promise and sending your Son to destroy the works of the devil. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of our King, use your mighty word to shatter our pride and to rouse us from spiritual slumber and apathy. Move us to take to heart the words of John, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You sent your Son to redeem us from sin. Let this good news be our joy and strength. Use it to cheer the lonely, encourage the fearful, and give hope to the despairing. In these days before Christmas, spare us from the stress of deadlines and the frenzy of commercialism. Fill our lives with the message of your peace and the music of your grace. Direct our eyes not only to the manger, but also to the skies, where we will see your Son coming again, not as a lowly child, but as the Lord of Lords. Lift up our hearts in joyful anticipation of that day. The Lord, you are our great physician, the physician of the body and the soul. You chasten and you heal. We pray that you would look with mercy on your servant, Harry Short, as over this last weekend he suffered a minor stroke. Through your good and gracious will, you have granted him a quick recovery, but yet the coming months proved to be a time of trepidation, a time of worrisome as another stroke could come again. So we pray, Lord, that you would restore his strength and his health, as you have done, to keep him strong and firm in that health. Deal compassionately with him and bless the medical means employed on his behalf with your healing power. We know that he is in your care, Lord. You will watch over him and you will protect him because you are a faithful and merciful God. Now hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions.
Come quickly, Lord Jesus, in your grace, in your power, and in your glory. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. We pray the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord whose way John the Baptist prepared when he called people to repentance and re pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you until life everlasting. Depart in peace and in joy. Your sins are forgiven. sing the song of Simeon, a song that Simeon sang when he held little baby Jesus in his arms, realizing he saw before him salvation was his. Let's sing that now on page 14 in the bulletin. Humanity. 
We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.
uh, given by Mr. Alan Emery, the chairman of the Property Improvement Committee, to inform you what's going on and talk about the three major things, the cost of what it's going to do to remodel the front, uh, and then also ideas for inside the sanctuary. Um, so come to that uh, right here after service. And if you are so inclined to come Christmas caroling at 1 o'clock today, and you want to stick around and you want to catch the meeting, we got you some food. Uh, so we have some sub sandwiches that we'll uh, bring out here for uh, lunch. And that'll be for anybody who wants to stay after service today. Um, we'll have that just out on the table. So with that, just say hello to the people you worship with today. Um, Come on into the fellowship hall when you're when you're ready, and uh, grab some. We'll get some food out pretty pretty soon. Give me a few minutes for that. Um, and then for those of you who are heading out, I'll get to the back and shake your hands. Wish you God's blessings on your day.